Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am back to talk about the transfer deadline. How did you think it went? Yeah, first and foremost, apologies for last night. I was going to be going on at the very death between 11 and 12 o'clock but unfortunately a slight technical mishap didn't allow me to do that. Um, a few people said obviously I'd fallen asleep or um, maybe you know, there was an issue with my computer system. Yeah, something like that. But uh, I didn't miss anything last night, did I? We covered it in the, the bulletins before then. But I wake up this morning to the, the usual diatribe from the likes of Charlie Nicholas. And you've got to ask uh, champion Charlie, where did it all go wrong? Because there was certainly nothing wrong with Celtic's transfer window when you look at who we brought in the kind of calibre, the stature of the players that were brought in, uh, topped off by Diego Lazalt, um, who, you know, when you're starting to look at that type of player, that level of quality on the left-hand side, maybe to balance the uh, quality that we've already got out on the right with Frimpong, it really is, um, it's exciting, it's an exciting prospect. So first and foremost, yeah, apologies for last night. We put out three broadcasts yesterday. We then had a pre-recorded podcast at night time and by 11 o'clock, unfortunately, I did not have the equipment at home that I thought I did. So we're here and uh, we're going to have a wee chat about Celtic's transfer window, whether or not you were chuffed with that. Um, but again, looking at the narrative, looking at uh, an ex-player in Charlie Nicholas coming away and saying that Celtic uh, went out on the cheap and they, you know, they took the cheap option. You know, this is going back to something we've spoken about on a Celtic state of mind before in relation to people just saying things with no basis. I mean, because that simply factually is incorrect. Celtic haven't taken the cheap option. When you look at the, the personnel that, that's been brought in, um, Red Scotland, you've been shouting on my, my P45. Sorry about that yesterday, just with the three broadcasts. But yeah, I would have loved to have done a, a transfer deadline at the death podcast and uh, put it out to you guys. But unfortunately, the system I thought was going to use didn't work. So schoolboy error. I'm going to walk through a lot of your your um, comments via Facebook, Twitter and also YouTube uh, today because when I'm on my own, which I am today, unfortunately, Big Lawrence is normally in with me on a Tuesday, but he came in yesterday for the transfer instead, the transfer deadly, um, and he wouldn't be able to come in two days on the bounce because these guys are obviously travelling in from their respective homes to join us on a Celtic state of mind. Um, so we're flying solo. Uh, hopefully everything's going well at your end in terms of the sound and the visuals. Um, but I will be definitely looking at everything that's coming in from your end to see how you felt the transfer window went uh, over the piece. Because personally, I asked the question kind of early on, is this one of Celtic's? best transfer windows um, in uh, modern history and you know it probably is up there to be honest with you uh, I was looking at some of them yesterday with Colin Lawrence and Kevin and I think one of the ones that stood out was probably uh, Brendan Rodgers' first season if we're talking modern history let's look at maybe the nine in a row era and the transfer windows that we had in uh, those seasons I think when when Rodgers came in we've seen a, a complete change and an upturn um, an upturn in the quality of player that we were, we were bringing in. Um, if you compare, you know, what I would call season five, which was um, Ronnie Dyler's final season at Celtic, and you compare the transfers that we did that season uh, to Brendan Rodgers' first season, what we're looking at in, uh, Rod, uh, you know, Ronnie's last season was uh, bringing in players like Boyata, who was a success, Sadie Yanko, Nadia Chifchi, uh, Scott Allen, Tyler Blackett, Ryan Christie, Jozo Simunovic, Carlton Cole, uh, Eric Sviachenko, Paddy Roberts and Colin Kazim Richards. We did lose Virgil van Dijk, uh, Puki and Matthews in the same season. So we brought in a lot of players, but in terms of quality, uh, I think it would be safe to say Paddy Roberts' second spell wasn't as good as his first. Uh, Simunovic turned out to be a decent player, albeit quite disappointing when you look at the amount of games he missed. Ryan Christie turned into an excellent signing, a, a great bit of business, and Boyata was a good signing as well. But when you compare that to the following season, when Brendan Rodgers comes in with a completely different approach uh, to player recruitment, Chris Iyer comes in, but that was a legacy signing. Obviously, he'd been identified by Ronnie Dyla. 
Musa Dembele, what a signing that was. And, you know, there was a suggestion that uh, he may make that move from Lyon to one of the English clubs. Spurs were quoted as being interested. It's not happened. Um, Toure, Scotty Sinclair came in and what an impact he made. Uh, De Vries and Kouassi. So you, you don't win them all. Um, and we lost players, first team players like Stoke Skepovic, Charlie Mulgrew and Stefan Johansson. Uh, I think there was probably some games left in your hands and the rest of them we weren't too concerned about at that time so I would compare the current window um, to probably Brendan Rodgers' first season in terms of quality but brought in El Yunusi on loan um, Barkas the goalkeeper you know quite quickly after realising that Foster wasn't going to come back to Celtic we've gone out and signed Barkas from Athens for four and a half million um, Albiana Yeti a real quality signing from West Ham for around £5 million. David Turnbull comes in from Motherwell for around £3 million. I wouldn't call him a project signing. I know that um, he's certainly not going to walk into that first team simply because of the players that um, are in that part of the, the squad in and around the midfield areas. Um, I wouldn't call Turnbull a project signing. I think a project signing is someone who comes in like Sorrow and Klamala to a lesser degree, who you don't really expect to see maybe for half a year, maybe 12 months even. And then they start to, to come into the side. Shane Duffy came in on loan from Brighton. And of course, the transfer business was completed with uh, Diego Lazalt coming in. You know, is there anywhere else on the pitch that you wanted Celtic to strengthen? Because I, I'm looking around there. One of the biggest successes is the fact that we haven't lost anyone. We've not lost any of our first team players. Um, there was loads of talk about, you know, Chris Ayer to AC Milan and Cham. And we'll come back to that because there was some last minute bids for and Cham. Ryan Christie, uh, there was speculation around odds on Eduard. And we've kept all of our first teamers, which is just brilliant. Brilliant business. Under the circumstances, you know, as Celtic fans, we've invested massively in season tickets and we continue to do that uh, with uh, sales of merchandise, you know, after the, the launch of the Adidas uh, merch. So brilliant. And I think there would have been an area of disappointment, certainly, if any of the big four um, were allowed to leave. And we've held on to them all, which is just brilliant. It's a great bit of business by Celtic. It's a commitment, really to the 10 it's a commitment to a season where we still have European football to look forward to we've got an exciting group coming up we've got two Scottish Cups to play for and we've got a League Cup so five tournaments still in it um, how many of those can you you know really realistically win how many of those um, I'm hoping for at least a treble to be fair and uh, we will go back to your, your points via Facebook Twitter and also on YouTube haven't if you haven't already subscribed to us on youtube please do that our content is free one of the ways that we're able to offer everything that we do free charge is uh, through sponsorship um, and we have secured sponsorship over the next four months with fans bet you might remember fans bet were involved with the celtic state of mind a while back and um, their sponsorship banners and logos etc will appear but not in such a way that it's going to impose on your experience when you're tuning into a Celtic state of mind. Today it's just me but normally you will also be joined by someone like Kevin Graham, Lawrence Connolly, Colin and uh, Stephen Mullen and on Friday we're going to announce a new Friday bulletin pundit who's going to be joining us once a week uh, to give us his views. Oh I've given it away yet it certainly is a male um, his views on Celtic, all things Celtic. It would be great to get uh, some ladies involved, come along, be pundits, get involved in the podcast. So if you're up for that, get in touch. Um, we'll go right to the comments that are coming through and see what you felt about the Celtic transfer window. Stephen Ray, big uh, kudos yesterday for Stevie when we signed Lazalt because you were the guy that said we should sign him quite a few weeks ago now. Six players signed who are ready-made starters. How much credit goes to Nick Hammond? Have we seen the last of the £2 million projects from some backwater leagues? Uh, quality over quantity is the way ahead. There's not much to disagree uh, with there, I've got to say, Stevie. Um, you know, when I look at even maybe this, the first season of the nine, uh, which could be the ten, and the types of players that we're bringing in at that point. I'm not comparing them like for like, but you look at the uh, the players we brought in, Kelvin Wilson, Adam Matthews, Victor Wanyama, Fraser Foster, 
Um, it tails off at the end, I've got to say. Uh, Mo Bangura and El Kaduri, who was a lone player. Um, you look at certainly the first four of those players. They first four, they were first team players. So they come in, they're not going to walk into a Celtic side, but they're first team players. Uh, Foster and Manyama in particular became staple parts of the side for um, a few seasons. Uh, Wilson and Matthews eventually uh, moved on. But what what's interesting about that is the type of player that Neil Lennon is targeting now um, is a first-team starter. Uh, so although I'm not comparing the, the personnel like for like, it's all about bringing in a player that is going to be pushing for a first-team jersey, I think, with Neil Lennon. I think that has his outlook on recruitment. How much credit, you ask, um, should Nick Hammond uh, be given for that? I think quite a bit, to be honest with you, Stephen. Uh, when you're looking at the situation with the goalie, for example, Fraser Foster, I think most of us wanted Big Fraz back in. Even if it was on loan, we would have been happy with that. And when it was clear that it was not to be, we worked very quickly on that, didn't we? So we had the file in place. We had done the scouting. We knew who uh, our second choice was going to be and we got the deal done. I think a big part of that is is having that filing cabinet. Uh, and I use that, obviously, as, as uh, a wee uh, throwback to what Davey Hay had when he worked with Tommy Burns. He had a filing cabinet of players that um, we had scouted, we had watched, we were aware of. And, uh, you know, how well that system worked when we were able to dip into, uh, you know, the, the scouting records of the likes of Cadetti. Uh, some of these players had played against us, of course. Andreas Tom, uh, Pierre van Hoydonk, Paolo Di Canio. So, um, you know, when you've got the, the network in place and, you know, you miss out on a, a player like Foster, you can go into that scouting network and there he is, Barkas, he's come in. I don't think many Celtic fans are disappointed with Barkas, um, but it goes back again to the headline here, Champion Charlie, where did it all go wrong? What happened to Sha Champion Charlie? What happened to um, this this exciting uh, prodigy, prodigious chat talent that came through the ranks at Celtic? And, you know, he was probably the finest player to come through at Celtic since, um, you know, the, the departed Kenny Dalglish, um, who had left in 77. Celtic fans still struggled years later to get over the departure of Dalglish. And then we had a new um, pin-up, a new playboy in uh, Charlie Nicholas. He came in, he was prolific, he looked the part, he had the style. But all too soon he went down to London and, um, you know, Players uh, come back often um, to less effective uh, teams and that's what happened to, to Charlie Nicholas. He comes back in the 1990s. He had one season under Liam Brady where he scored 20-odd goals. So I think at that stage, Celtic fans were still keen on Charlie. Um, we knew that he was coming to the end of his time. But thereafter, what happened with Charlie is he continually, you know, criticises the club. Now, I'm all about criticising where criticism is due. And the big one this season for me was after Ferenc Varos. I'm a big Neil Lennon fan, but after that game, it was my opinion that it was actually the selection of the team that was to be knocked out. So I was critical of Neil Lennon, but you've got to back it up. So, so that, that's what you try and do. You try and do it in a balanced way. So for Charlie Nicholas to come out this morning or late last night and say that Celtic have conducted their transfer business on the cheap, where is his basis for that? I mean, you look at the players that were brought in. El Yunusi. So he's coming in as a £16 million player at Southampton. Now, the wages that he's on will be astronomical. You see some of the, the wages, you know, the players that are mentioned over the last few days there, Snodgrass, you know, have reported 50 grand plus wage weekly. Celtic looked at that wage, looked at the loan fee that uh, West Ham wanted and decided against the deal. But you look at the actual structure of the Mo El Yunusi deal, you know, the, the wages alone, um, on top of that, the actual loan fee, because there's no way Southampton are allowing a £16 million player to come to Celtic uh, without us paying a couple of million quid. And it would have been the same last year as well. So he's come in almost like a, like a, a signing, although he's on loan. Uh, Vasilis Barkas, we miss out on Fraser Foster, Obviously, we were trying to put a loan deal together for him. But we, we go out and spend four and a half million pounds on our second choice goalkeeper, who is our number one without a shadow of a doubt. 
I'll be an Ayeti again coming in from the England Premier League, the English Premier League, where the wages are astronomical. I mean, they're preposterous, actually. When you look at the money spent um, in the English League uh, over the last, uh, over this, this transfer window, particularly during the situation that we're currently in, where people are, you know, struggling to get by, people are being made redundant on a daily basis, businesses are going under, yet the England English Premier League are spending billions of pounds on footballers. There was a poll this morning about um, Chelsea's transfer activity and whether or not Chelsea fans were happy with spending over 200 million quid. And their transfer activity was rated as a 2.6 out of 5. Unbelievable. So we're buying from that market, that market which is just off the scale. And we're bringing in a player like a Yeti who similarly to El Yunusi had a big money move from Basel or Baal from Switzerland into the English Premier League. He signs for West Ham United for 8 million quid on massive wages. We bring him to the club, we bring him to Celtic on, for 5 million pounds and also the wage packet that he'll be on as well. David Turnbull, one of the most promising, if not the most promising youngsters in Scottish football. We sign him from Motherwell. Motherwell get £3 million pounds plus for one of their young talents and Celtic have a player that can play first team football immediately as he showed against St Johnston wasn't his best game but he can play he's an option but also we're looking to the future with him Shane Duffy comes in from Brighton loan deal from Brighton English Premier League Charlie so Shane Duffy there's a loan fee so there's a loan fee for Shane Duffy there's a loan fee for El Yunusi and Duffy will be on big wages as well that's why it took so long to get the deal done and then yesterday we're signing a player from AC Milan, Lazol, a guy who shone for Uruguay. And, you know, you're saying that we've gone out in the cheap. Absolute nonsense. Total nonsense from Charlie Nicholas. And these people need to be challenged when they've got a platform to come out and just say things without any kind of basis. Totally unbalanced from Charlie Nicholas. Now, if you're going to criticise the club, back it up, Charlie. That was absolute nonsense from you. Um, so... Good luck with, you know, trying to find your own platform because that kind of output is totally unacceptable and it needs to be challenged. Now, we've got John Hewitt coming on. Um, not the same John Hewitt who played in Charlie's second spell at Celtic. Good window for us. Good players in, excess players out, offers rejected and players kept. Shows the board are behind Lennon and the fans and wanting more. Brilliant points you've made there, John, because I have got it uh, noted here that we need to speak about Olivier and Cham. And that leads on to one of the points you made there. The big four that, you know, let's be honest, we spoke about it right up until yesterday on the bulletins. Kevin Graham and Lawrence Conley and Colin Watt, all Celtic season ticket holders, lifelong Celtic fans, like many, many of the people that tune into the broadcasts. And I asked them the question, if you had to lose one of those players, who would it be? Thinking that we probably were going to wake up this morning with one of the guys away. We knew that there had been confirmed interest from AC Milan. It was brilliant that we went and done business with AC Milan instead of selling them a player. We knew that there had been interest uh, or speculation of interest around in Cham. I wasn't convinced that the English clubs were interested in Cham. I mean, when you see the, the, the kind of players that Southampton, for example, were being linked with. And you're looking at Cham and he wasn't he wasn't quoted. You're looking at the players that Arsenal were going out and buying, that Aston Villa Aston Villa bought really well actually, that Aston Villa were interested in. There was no mention of odds on Edward. And had they come in for Edward, they probably would have been looking to get a deal on Edward that isn't a deal that's going to suit Celtic because we need to get, when the time comes, top dollar for Edouard. So the timing's not great at the moment because Celtic are in a predicament, like every other football club, and the English teams are spending money as though nothing's happening in the world, you know, nothing's changed. So, you know, I'm glad we didn't entertain that. I'm glad we didn't entertain the ire, um, £14 million, pounds, circa £14 million, pound, um, kind of deal with AC Milan. They were interested. How interested, we don't know, but it was confirmed interest. Christy, we all know the situation with, with Ryan Christie's contract. Now, I mentioned a player earlier in Dedrick Boyata. He was a player that came into us from Manchester City, took a wee while to establish himself, but when he did, 
you know, he is one of the best centre halves we've had during the nine in a row either. I don't think you would argue with that. Let me know if you were you weren't a big fan. I know that he ruffled a few feathers in relation to his departure from the club and down in tools, etc. However, we ended up losing uh, Bayata for nothing. When I think the club were quite keen to let him go for nine million pound to fool him. Brennan Rogers wanted to keep him, we kept him, he goes for no fee. We're in a similar situation with Ryan Christie. Now, Christie is a player who came in with loads of promise. He came in in the last season of Ronnie Dyla. And according to John Hughes, who was on the, the podcast a couple of months back, uh, John Collins really did push for Christie. Obviously, Yogi and Collins are very tight. Um, but Collins was very keen on Ryan Christie. Celtic did the deal. And Inverness Cali Thistle got their cash and it was a windfall for them. And they've got a, a sell on as well on on the player, which is uh, the norm these days. It's fifteen percent. Now, Chrissy developed, a, I think, um, a, a, a stage where we we had all kind of resigned ourselves to losing him. We thought, you know, the the spell that he had, had at Aberdeen was going to um, result in a return to Aberdeen, probably on a permanent basis. And at that point. We would have all licked our wounds and said, you know, it never worked out for the guy. Because if you look at uh, Ronnie Dyler's last season, another promising Scottish youngster came in in Scott Allen. We thought we had high hopes for Scott Allen and we had high hopes for Ryan Christie. It looked as though both deals hadn't gone as well as we had hoped. And then Ryan Christie comes in. He's the most improved player in the Celtic squad. He conditions himself to a point where I think he put on one and a half stone, probably in pure muscle. He comes back and he, you know, the way that he was able to grab a, a game by the scruff of the neck and make changes and he was creative and he scored goals and, you know, what a player he's been ever since his uh, reintroduction to the Celtic side. But unfortunately, there's a situation at the moment where the club and the player can't agree on a deal. So that may mean that um, Ryan Christie eventually leaves Celtic on a free transfer or freedom of contract rather. The old free transfer, obviously. Is something that benefits the player or did back in the day in relation to there being no transfer fee and you can negotiate higher wages, etc. So that type of thing is quite similar in the modern day. And I, I did expect there to be some kind of movement in the midfield area. So what's then happened then, as John has quite rightly said, is a couple of bids did come in for Encham. So Olivier and Cham, two bids come in from uh, Brest and Bordeaux, uh, one of which I think was a loan deal. And the club have, have stood firm on that and we've kept them. And we've kept and Cham, who is in a position where we have an embarrassment of riches. We've just strengthened it with Turnbull coming in. We've got Ryan Christie, we've got El Yunusi. And then further back in the, in the park, we've got McGregor and Brown. So that area of the pitch, you know, we are uh, well represented. We've also got Tommy Rogic, let's not forget, he came back in against St Johnston. And, you know, if there had been a move and it was in Cham, I think that was the, the one that was easiest to take, certainly for myself and the, the guests who had been in this week. But we stood firm on that. We kept them. We didn't lose any of our top players. Uh, we're strengthened in all the areas, I believe. It would have been nice, perhaps. Um, to, I thought we were going to bring in two. Um, I'm not too concerned about the goalkeeper situation. It's something that Kevin brought up yesterday. You want to have three goalkeepers, that's fair enough. But, you know, we're running with two. It's an unusual season and uh, I think we can run with two. But I'm I'm more than happy and um, I, I was criticised to a degree when I said, uh, I, I asked the question, is this Celtic's best transfer window? Now, people obviously gave me examples of us bringing in Henry Larson uh, to stop the 10 and uh, that was a particularly good period of bringing players in but I, I was trying to um, say it was the best transfer window back then there was no windows was it you could buy players and strengthen your team just about any time and we brought in some late additions and Reaper uh, and Lambert who were brilliant additions that season as well but when I'm looking at um, transfer windows and I'm looking at uh, the last nine seasons let's say and this being the 10th it's up there. It definitely is up there with Brendan Rodgers' first season, which was a particularly good one for transfers. So we'll run through as many of your comments as we possibly can. John Hewitt. Not that John Hewitt, 
but I was lucky enough to see my namesake wear the hoops with pride. If not, when we should have bought him. Yeah, absolutely. John Hewitt come back, uh, came into Celtic actually, um, kind of later on in his career, and everybody remembered him as being um, the man who scored European winners for Aberdeen, a uh, prolific scorer for Aberdeen that he was as well. Didn't quite hit it off at Celtic, but also always remember when uh, Billy McNeil signed John Hewitt. We signed him for two hundred and fifty grand. Um, and we signed, you know, Martin Hayes uh, a wee bit earlier on. We signed Martin Hayes for 650. So that was a million quid out the door for players who barely played um, for Celtic. Now, Richard McMinn via YouTube. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. We're pushing those subscription figures up. At the moment, we're looking to get 3,000 in and we'll keep pushing them up. It's all free. As I say, we're securing sponsors. And at the moment, we've got a sponsorship deal with Fans Bet. Their details are at the top of your screen. And um, we will continue to, to find sponsorship that doesn't encroach on your um your experience of a Celtic state of mind. Richard McMinn is happy with the window. We will be a really good team when it all clicks into place. I do not see us having many issues in the Scottish game 10 in a row easily. I think we will win 10 in a row. I do agree with you, Richard. I don't think it's, we're going to get anything easy this season. And the reason for that, there's a few reasons. Uh, Lawrence and I spoke at length about the uh, the poor um, refereeing that we have experienced this season. Now, that can become a bit of cl a cliche. I get Celtic fans tell me to, you know, get on with it. You're winning games, blah, 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 evens out. I don't think it does. I think the standard of refereeing in Celtic games is particularly poor. And the two examples so far this season, although I'm, I'm sure there's many others um, during Celtic games, the two games that stand out for me, it's the St Johnson game that we've just witnessed there, where the refereeing was, you know, it was abysmal. You know, the amount uh, tackles and um, fouls that St Johnson got away with was shocking. And the other game was a Dundee United one. So I don't think it will be easy this season. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we're getting nothing at the moment um, in terms of decisions. We really are not getting anywhere near the level of decisions. Look at uh, Patrick Clamalla scoring the second goal he was taken out it was a sending off offence and there was two or three in the game sending off offences that were ignored and um, you know we the problem with that that I've got and I'm glad we've got a strong squad is that players like um, Jeremy Frimpong who seems to to be on the end at the moment in more bad tackles than any other player in Scottish football um, you know, all it takes is for him to get injured. We've already got an injury to James A. Forrest. So if Jeremy Frimpong gets injured, then you're struggling in that area of the park, you know, on the right-hand side. Who do you play then who's got the same offensive ability? Um, you know, someone might say, well, you play El Hamid as a right wing back. But yeah, by the way, brilliant cross for the first goal for Griffiths at the weekend. But he's not Frimpong in terms of creativity. He's not James Forrest in terms of goals. So... You're then looking into who's your third choice on the right-hand side? Is it Karamoko Dembele? And yeah, again, I had mentioned that uh, Dembele had asked for a transfer. Um, there was a few other players that uh, left the building. And, you know, at the last count during that transfer window, you know, unless a few other youngsters uh, left after Aitchison yesterday, 20, 27 players left Celtic during that transfer window. Um, now, albeit quite a few of them were loan deals, 12 loan deals, and, you know, eight first-team players or players that you would class as first-team players, would you class eight just and I know that he had played for the first team. Um, so a lot of players left left the club, but thankfully none of them were the pivotal members of the side that I think we need in order to win 10 in a row. I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, I think there is a challenge. I do think there's a challenge and, um, you know, there was a, there was a similar challenge last year and the, the challenge uh, withered out uh, after Christmas, uh, famously. But that also was down to the fact that, that Celtic were ruthless in their pursuit of uh, the title and, and the treble, and um, which obviously is still up for grabs. We're playing Aberdeen in the semi-final with the Scottish Cup. So... It's not going to be easy. I don't think it's going to be easy on a few different uh, levels. First of all, there is a challenge there. Uh, but al also, secondly, you know, the, the, I have a real concern with the, the level uh, of the officials uh, over a few games 
this 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 season so far and I think that will continue and it's something that does concern me. John, you come back in. Is Charlie a little bitter because when he came back to the Celts he was shown to be a shadow of the player we sold and the fans let him know that? Or was he not being paid enough in his eyes? Well, I remember when, you know, when Charlie came back in uh, 1990, Celtic fans were happy at that time. I think we wanted them back in 1987. Frank McAvenny speaks about this. We wanted Charlie back when, when Maka signed. Um, but the only the only issue with, with Maka was not there long enough because he was brilliant. I mean, would you have taken Charlie instead of Maka in the, in the centenary season? Uh, with hindsight, obviously, the answer is no, you wouldn't because Maka was dynamite. Frank McAvenny, until fairly recently, was in my all-time um, Celtic 11 and the team I pick is from my lifetime so I know that you know Jimmy McGrory would be in any Celtic uh, greatest 11 but from my lifetime from the players that I witnessed McAvenny was in that team he was uh, leading the, the forward line with Henrik Larson, and it's only since uh, players like uh, Dembele and Edward have come into the, the Celtic side has Maka been dropped to the bench but I love the guy as a Celtic player but we tried to get Charlie Nicholas back in 1987 I think the fans wanted him. And then in 1990, he eventually comes. But I take your point, John. He wasn't the, the Charlie of old. He had put on weight. Um, and he wasn't as prolific as, as the young Charlie Nicholas. I mean, in 1983, when Charlie Nicholas leaves Celtic for Arsenal, it was British football's hottest property. Everybody knows, famously, he could have gone just about anywhere. He chose London. He chose Arsenal. He probably should have gone to, to Liverpool. And again, that's me with hindsight, but I think people were saying that at the time as well. Should have gone to Liverpool. So, Charlie Nicholas did come back. Um, there was also that attitude around Charlie when he left that he was chasing the dollar and he was pushing for a move. You know, to be fair to him, and again, that's what it's all about uh, with Charlie Nicholas, and that's why I've put his name on the, the lead banner here. It's all about balance. I've since found that, um, you know, Celtic actually pushed for him. Um, Celtic pushed for him to leave the club and Charlie wanted to stay uh, but the way that Celtic dealt with players back then is they were in control and 750 grand at that time um, for a Celtic board was astronomical for a player who we'd brought through the ranks and that's what we did that's what we were good at there was almost a conveyor belt of players that came through you know from the 50s 60s 70s and right into the 80s that um, we brought through for uh, relatively low um, amounts of money because they're coming through the, the youth ranks and we sell them on for, for big profits and that's what we did with Charlie so yeah maybe there is a bit of bitterness um, I, I find it sad with any ex -Celts, I really do I just find it sad John that an ex-Celtic player who has shared the moments with Celtic with the club with the fans and they've shared successes and they're in the history books you know we, this is the thing we can't you know airbrush guys out of history some of them we would like to um, you know, there's some players that would like to airbrush out history for other reasons, but they're part of the history. They're part of this club's great history. And when they go a bit bitter towards us and they come away with, with claims like Charlie come away with today, and, you know, there's probably going to be some comments, and I'll work through as many as I can, saying that we, we've, got to, uh, we've got to ignore um, bitter ex-players or we've got to ignore the media. And I don't think I subscribe to that. I really don't. I think you've got to challenge it you've got to challenge it and I think when we've got a platform now uh, a Celtic state of mind we've got a platform as a, a podcast as a broadcast and as something that's increasing in numbers all the time um, we are trying to enable Celtic fans to get their views across now you know, when one person's here monitoring the questions coming in and trying to manage that against some other queries and comments that come in that are um, inappropriate to what we're talking about it's all it's always difficult to get as many of you guys and girls involved in the discussion but we try to get as much of your points across as possible um, and a good cross-section of points coming in uh, all the time every single day because I do feel that the 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 tables are turning in terms of output um, content media and you know Charlie comes away and says that. It becomes a headline. Every news source 
uh, will run with the story. And Celtic sites will run with the story. We're running with it now, but we're certainly not running with it to give them a platform to just say things without any balance. We're running with it to challenge them and say, you're wrong. You're 100% wrong. Give me your argument to, to back up the fact that Celtic went on the cheap during this transfer window. Not only are you wrong, I mean, do you not know what's going on in the world, Charlie? If Celtic went out there and we've gone out and we've, we've brought in six first-team players, right? Now, just count them. How many came in from the uh, English Premier League, right? So you've got Shane Duffy, um, El Yunusi and Ayeti. So 50% of our transfer business has been done with English clubs. The English clubs who are spending more money than French clubs and German clubs and Spanish clubs. They've spent billions just in this transfer window. Chelsea have spent over 200 million quid. And you're saying that we're doing it on the cheap. We're operating at a level and in a market that is higher than any other market on the globe. So we're not doing it on the cheap. So you've got to challenge these people and you've got to actually pick holes in, in what they're saying because just opening your mouth and saying stuff and getting paid for it is unacceptable. Um, and when you're looking, yeah, it's disappointing when it's an XL that comes away and says things like that, then I think we've got to challenge them even more. Uh, Macaroon, you are commenting on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. And for everybody on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. It costs you nothing. We're trying to keep it. In fact, we are keeping it free um, and we're keeping it free because we're able to secure sponsorship deals with the likes of uh, fans bet who are sponsoring the bulletin in the match day for the next four months macaroon got to be happy with the window no major players leave and signed first team players not projects that is a sign of a lot of the comments that are coming in macaroon no excuses now deliver the 10. i'm now going to ask the question just while we're on here do we now or we might have had it before but do we have a squad now that you're confident that uh, Celtic will win 10 in a row? There's a question. Please tell me your opinions, make your comments and ask your questions as we go through this. I'm continually having to refresh myself because I'm doing all the talking today. So um, apologies for that if there's any short breaks. And um, we've also got John Sweeney coming in. John saying... Charlie has spent too long down south and Celtic have spent a lot of money in the transfer window and no excuses from the manager now if we don't win the 10. There's been investment, hasn't there, John? There's been big investment. And when, as I say, you're dipping your toe into the English market, um, be that a permanent deal with a Yeti or the two loan deals, it's a big outlay. It's a massive financial outlay that Celtic have put out there. Um and to be honest with you, when, when you're sitting here and you hear that Celtic are, are about to announce someone from Uruguay, Uruguay International, and, and Cavani pops up outside Celtic Park on Sky Sports, I thought Lawrence was going to fall off his seat. And it happened twice to us there, but um, we've, we've not quite done that in terms of a marquee signing, but I think we're past that anyway. We used to do the old marquee signing from time to time. Um, I'm thinking Roy Keane, um, even Tommy Gravison, to a degree, was a marquee signing. Um, I don't think we're doing that. We're actually signing players to fill gaps in the squad or in the team uh, that Lennon, Neil Lennon has identified. And I think it's been a particularly good transfer window. What would you give it out of 10? Give me your, your thoughts on that. Give me the transfer window out of 10. Marks out of 10. Stephen Forbes, Barkas, welcome back to the show, Stephen. Barkas, Ayeti, Turnbull, Duffy, El Yunusi, Lazalt, and no big name departures. An excellent window. However, this still includes those who don't want to be there, as Lennon stated. Hope they settle now. Well, see, yesterday, I spoke about um, Neil Lennon's man management. Now, as quickly as we are to criticise decisions that are made, bad results and bad performances, I think you've got to uh, also give credit where it's due. And I just think, you know, we've seen situations since Neil Lennon came back to Celtic as a manager. We've seen situations where he's managed... Uh, players and he's managed them very very well so he's managed Lee Griffiths first time round last season managed them back into the squad back into the side and he looked as though he was actually developing a partnership with Eduard last season he managed in Cham 
back into the Celtic side after he made it known through the French media that he wanted to leave the club. He was unhappy in Scotland. Um, a lot of Celtic fans, me included, were very unhappy with the comments because we don't like to see people criticising the club, do we? We get very protective of Celtic. And, and Cham came back into the side and he was a major part of our successes last season and so far this season. So we're now in a situation where Neil Lennon has admitted that um, the transfer speculation had affected odds on Edward. You know, he's not asked for a transfer. Um, his agent hadn't uh, ruffled anybody's feathers at the club. Um, he wasn't agitating for a move, but it had affected him. So now Edward can put that behind him. The transfer window is closed. He's not going to believe in Celtic. So I think now it's down to the player and it's down to Neil Lennon. And I have the confidence that Neil Lennon has the man management ability to get the best tune out of Edward as well. The only question I would have is who's his best partner up front? Because what you now have is you've got a jetty and I would have probably said that he is his ideal partner. You've got Griffiths now back in the team and Griffiths showed last season what he can do alongside Eduard. And you've also got Klamala. And uh, Klamala's almost like the wild card, isn't he? He's the guy that I wrote off, I think, at the beginning of the season. But in terms of application, yes, that should be a prerequisite for any player in a Celtic jersey and, and I get that. Uh, but the application's been brilliant and he's, he's contributing, isn't he? He's contributing with, with goals. And I think um, his goals per minute ratio is very, very good. Um, one of the, the statos might want to tell us what that is, but it's excellent because he doesn't start many games. So he's coming on for 15 minutes as he did against St. John's, or for a half, uh, I think he did against Livy. So, yeah, we've got four options now. What is what is Edward's best option? So that's another one that we need to, um, to look at and uh, Neil Lennon will need to decide. Joseph, you're commenting on YouTube. Very happy with the business we have done this window. Now time for the, the team to set, settle down for the remainder of this season and get the best out of the team that we've now got. Love the content, by the way. Well, thanks very much, Joseph. And I appreciate massively that um, I did promise a fourth broadcast last night. But unfortunately, or fortunately, um, I wasn't able to get it linked up via my, my tablet at home. So apologies for that. Um, if I was able to, I would have come on last night and we would have been probably talking about roughly what we're talking about now, other than the Charlie Nicholas stuff. Um, and we've also got Mark Gal Charlie sitting there thinking Lennon will be annoyed at our transfer dealing. Shows how far he has drifted from reality, trying to keep himself relevant. Yeah, you're right. There was a comment there. Obviously, Charlie's done a lot of work uh, on English football. Um, surely he knows what the state of the game is in Scotland in terms of finance. Surely he knows that. We look at the English game and you could almost say that the money they've spent is disgusting. You know, it really is. That level of financial outlay when clubs are spending over £100 million, over £200 million and the fans who aren't getting to the games are struggling in life, in general, in work, in business. We're, we're struggling to get through the pandemic. And when you're looking at that, you think to yourself, well, you know, really, is it appropriate for football clubs to be spending that? The biggest summer transfer windows in the Premier League, um, you know, this is the, the fourth biggest. £1.244 billion pounds spent in the Premier League in England this season during a global pandemic. It's just astonishing, isn't it? So is Charlie Nicholas still living in that bubble where he thinks it? Celtic and other clubs in Scotland can chuck about millions of pounds willy-nilly. I think Celtic have been shrewd. They've spent a lot of money. They've brought in six players, three from the England uh, English Premier League, and I've just showed you how much money they spend. Charlie, you're talking nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Um, and by the way, I've interviewed Charlie Nicholas. I've interviewed him. I interviewed him for one of my books. And he was great. He was absolutely brilliant. He gave me his time. He came across as a passionate Celtic man. That's a, some, Sometimes that's the thing that frustrates me with some of the ex-players. You know, Charlie Nicholas, it was funny because the mobile number, right, and I'm not giving, I'm not telling tales how to school, his mobile number, the last four digits was 1888. Or Charlie Nicholas, his mobile number. That was his last four digits. And then when I'm speaking to him, he spoke passionately about Celtic, passionately about his time coming through. 
his relationship with Neely Mockin, who used to look after the ground staff boys. Celtic daft, born and bred, and that's what annoys me. That's what frustrates me because you should know better. You should absolutely know better. Um, dominant decade green and white is commenting that the fans have backed the club, albeit virtually for now. Absolutely. All credit to the fans. But I mean, let's go back. Let's go back to um, the messianic figure of Fergus McCann coming in and saving the club. And let's not forget that he did save the club eight minutes from, at the time, what was called receivership. Uh, the equivalent, I believe, uh, would be administration at that time. And Fergus McCann, you know, eight minutes from the death, produces the payment that was required by the bank. What thereafter happened is Celtic were transformed. Celtic were dragged, kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Um, everything we had done up until then had been outdated and there had been a lack of investment in the stadium. There'd been a lack of investment in the team, really. Um, there'd been a lack of investment in the training facilities and in youth development, everything. Fergus McCann came in. But the important point is that McCann, and he knew this, Fergus McCann knew this, required the fans to back the club. They required the fans to back his share issue. And back his share issue we did. And there'll be loads of you out there with that certificate, that share certificate. Uh, we backed the club, we backed Fergus McCann. And although McCann did what was uh, required at that time, it was the club, it was the fans of that club that um, invested the money that allowed Fergus McCann to rebuild modern Celtic. And modern Celtic is what we now enjoy because since then, obviously, Celtic have been on a firm financial foot and I think there was a period of time where we had to review how the finances were going um, when we were spending big, big money on players and wages. And um, But since then, you know, Celtic... You look at the Martin O'Neill uh, period where he comes in and Stevie Mullen mentions this um, on a Celtic state of mind from time to time. Since O'Neill came in, Celtic have been the dominant force. Yeah, Rangers have won the odd title here and there since then, but Celtic have been the dominant force. So you're looking at the fans being there, the fans investing in the club. Um, and we rose like a phoenix from the flames, um, almost from the flames. And you're looking at uh, where we are now and the club required the fans to step up again and uh, to buy season tickets. At the time, we didn't know. We didn't know when we were going to get back to Celtic Park. There was this mooted um, October, middle of October. That was the date that was in my mind. That was the date, you know, we're heading for the, the, the first derby game of the season against Rangers. And that was the game that we were kind of focused on, wasn't it? We thought we were going to be in for that game. And we're now looking at a situation where I would be amazed if we're back in grounds by the end of the season. I hope that there are some pilots. I really do hope that there's some test events um, for games involving Celtic and not just away from home. I think it would be great to have some of these test events uh, at Celtic Park between now and the end of the season. I would love that to be the case. I would absolutely love that to be the case. But I'm resigned to the fact that uh, I'll be watching the club virtually um, and all that investment in virtual season tickets and in merchandise and in anything else we can do to support the club has come from the fans and that's unquestionable. So uh, absolutely brilliant, great point. And uh, we've also got a point coming through from Michael Quinn. Great window. Hope Eddie finds his form. Once we click, there will be no stopping us. This is the, th the strange thing. Michael, football's full of cliches, isn't it? And we hear all the time about winning ugly and champions win ugly and all that. And, you know, they're cliches for a reason because that's exactly what happens. You know, you get the win. You get the win. But I think as Celtic fans, probably as football fans generally, we want to see it done um, in a way that's uh, it's good on the eye. It's pretty on the eye because Celtic have a great tradition of playing football in that way. And we have the players to do it. This is a big thing that Celtic fans might become frustrated with. We have creative, flair, entertaining players. We do have it in abundance. Um, and that's what we want to see at Celtic Park. And we've seen a bit of it against Hibs, I think. And uh, we've obviously dismantled a few sides at home 
and away, um, domestically. And I think that what you're saying there is we haven't yet clicked into top gear. I would agree with that. I think there is going to be a time someone is going to take a tanking from Celtic, you know. And I mean, you know, that might happen regularly, actually, throughout this this campaign. There's going to be other occasions where you're up against 10 and 11 men behind the ball. They're parking the bus. It's hard to break them down. I think with the introduction of Diego Lazalt, um, that we have another option and another outball um, on the left-hand side uh, where we can look for a bit more creativity down that left-hand side. We've already got it down the right with Frimpong. My only concern with Frimpong, as I said before, is that he's been kicked off the park at the moment. Um, and I'm hoping that that doesn't result in an injury to uh, the youngster. Now, Nick John is commenting on Facebook. Afternoon all. And a good afternoon to you and everybody else who's tuning in. Um, you know, we're 50 minutes into the, the, the broadcast. I've not had an opportunity to work my way through um, even a proportion of the amount of comments that's coming in, but I will continue to get through as many as I possibly can. Very happy with the window. Griff back like a new sign in every season. We have heard that. And as I said, football's all about cliches, but it's true. It's true about Griffiths. You can feel the, the creases are being ironed out. Great team bonding win on Saturday. Once we click, it's all over. So there's a few points coming in saying once we click. I think we're all of the understanding that we're not seeing this Celtic team um, in top gear at the moment, are we? And it's going to be a great, great prospect once they are all firing on all cylinders because we do have loads of creative players. Celtic have an incredible amount of creative players. And if, uh, if they all start clicking, then brilliant. Absolutely superb. Now, what I would like to say, Kevin Graham is uh, correcting me on my pronunciation of Lazalt, and he's saying that it's lack salt, according to our Spanish correspondent. So we have signed lack salt. So thank you for that, Kevin. Um, as long as you stop calling El Yunusi, El Ahusi, I will take your advice. But thank you very much for that. I'm looking forward to you getting back onto the uh, the broadcast very, very soon um, as well. So we are looking to get as many of the guys in, <coughs> excuse me, as many of the guys in as possible before the Rangers game, which uh, I'm looking forward to as well. Um, so another thing I would, I would mention as well, Celtic's youngest ever goal scorer, Jack Aitchison, left the club for a, a three-year deal at Barnsley. I think it's a good move for the for the boy. I really do. Um, when you're looking at the fact that we're talking about four strikers, all of whom could partner each other, all of whom could start a game, um, where's Jack Aitchison going to get a game at Celtic Park? So the youngster has been moved on and he's gone to Barnsley on a three-year deal. We wish him all the best. But it made me start thinking about other players who have that connection between Celtic and Barnsley. And the ones that come to my mind, um, Ronnie Glavin, showing my age. I did interview Ronnie once. Um, he is an absolute legend doing in Barnsley. Paddy McCourt. I love Paddy McCourt as well. Great guy, Paddy. Oh, I'm always willing to give you his time and uh, he's great chat, great company. Paddy McCourt obviously had a spell down at Barnsley after they left Celtic. I think he scored a mazy goal on his debut. Um, Paul McGugan. Anybody remember Paul McGugan out there? 1980s throwback. Um, Owen Archdeacon came through the ranks, so and did. Uh, scored against Rangers. And uh, I think he is a coach at Celtic. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Gary Doonan, if you're tuning in, will be able to tell me. Uh, is Owen Archdeacon still at the club in a coaching capacity, co coaching the youths? And another one that springs to my mind is Mick McCarthy. So Mick McCarthy, big centre half, although we signed him from Man City. Um, he had been down at Barnsley before then. So brilliant. I'm really, really chuffed uh, with, for Jack Aitchison. And also there's a few, you know, th there are a few players that you think to yourself, um, had been uh, on the fringes and, and really for the betterment of their own career had to move on uh, and I think Jack Aitchison was one of those he went away on loan to Forest Green Rangers didn't he, sorry, Forest Green Rovers is it? And um, he started off well, went off the boil a wee bit but a permanent move is a good one um, I think. Now Adam Adam, you're commenting on YouTube. I'd love to come on a channel one day. I've been living down south for 10 years and listening to Axom is one of the things that keeps me connected to other Celtic fans. 
Now, Adam, we are open to that. We really are open to getting people involved. It's going to be a lot easier, of course, uh, once we're able to mingle a wee bit more freely after this incredible situation has been resolved. It's never going to be fully resolved, is it? But um, we will be able to get back to some form of normality at some point. And at that stage, we want to get more people involved. We want to get more people involved in the studio. Um, at the moment, I'm not too keen on doing the old Zoom thing because I'll tell you why. We've got a studio here. And at the moment, we are able, uh, with all the precautions necessary, to get people in and we're able to uh, do broadcasts uh, in a safe way. And we do that in the studio. And I think uh, what you get from that is you get good sound quality and good visual quality. We've had a few issues, teething issues, that I think we've resolved. From time to time, the sound might drop out. It could be a loose connection or something, but you guys are quick enough to tell me, which is brilliant. But I'm against the Zoom because I think that when I'm watching things like... Um, mainstream media outlets like Sky Sports and they've got three or four guys in zooming and one of their, you know, Wi-Fi's is poor. It's just, it's not enjoyable to watch. So we're trying to avoid that. Um, but obviously there will be occasions where we may get an opportunity to get somebody in and the opportunity is too good to miss and we will get them zooming in if that is something that um, we have the, uh, we have the opportunity to do. Now, the urban Come on, help me out with the pronunciation. What does that say? Culture? 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 Celtic fans should get their news and views from podcasts like this. The mainstream media is dying. Keep up the good work. Now, the big thing with that, I, I really appreciate um, your comment in relation to what we're doing here at Celtic State of Mind. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to increase it. We're going to make it bigger. We're going to um, continue with more and more broadcasts, live and interactive is the way to go. These go out as podcasts as well from time to time not as regularly as we did before we get the opportunity of interviews the reason we're not doing it as regularly is it's not as easy to get um you know in the same room with other people and travel and that kind of thing so that will come back into play we're hoping to also get some pundits regular pundits who have been involved with celtic or involved with football and get their view on it as well so we're always looking to improve that all the time the thing with the mainstream media I'm no part of it, never have been. Um, there's some really, really good people out there. There really is some really, really good people doing some brilliant work. Um, but there are elements, of course, there's elements and there's publications. I mean, you could actually just say there's certain publications that um, don't do themselves any favours. Now, I can understand that the transition from print media to digital media is a difficult one. People lose their jobs, something I would never dance on on, on, the, on the, the grave of anybody that loses their job. Um, and I hate to see that, but there's a transitional period. And I think at the moment, uh, in order to ensure that they're getting enough of an audience, there's a lot of clickbait going on. There's a lot of clickbait. Now, clickbait can work in two ways. It can be a headline that draws you in. And once you get there, you know, they're not actually talking or writing about what actually attracted you to that, that platform. Or it can be just throwing out a grenade, knowing that if you throw something out there, um, in respect to Celtic and, and Scottish football, Celtic and Rangers, um, then you're going to get a reaction, positive or negative. So if you put out something there in relation to Celtic, so if you say something critical, you'll get a reaction. You'll get a reaction from people like us. So they're playing that game um, at the moment because obviously they're now relying uh, largely on sponsorship and advertising on their uh, the platforms online. So I, I understand why it happens, but quality and balanced views is what we want as football fans first and foremost um what happens in here we can get a bit passionate yeah and does that skew your view a bit of course it does and then maybe the following day our views change a wee bit so we accept that um and that's fine and i think you know when we're looking at for example when celtic bounced out the champions league but we're all disappointed hugely disappointed I made some comments in relation to who I thought was to blame. I stand by them and that's fine. If I changed my mind overnight, I'd come on and explain why. But you need that balance, don't you? Um, and there's loads of publications that, again, were staple parts of uh, your football upbringing at one point. You know, you went and got the papers and you delivered papers. Um, my first season ticket was only possible because I had paper rounds and I was able to save the money up and it was part of our upbringing. But things are changing just like the music industry is changing and just like the movie industry is going to change. 
during this pandemic as much as anything. Uh, everything is changing and it's all about adapting. And I think new services um, are adapting, but when you're seeing things that are unbalanced, it doesn't matter if it's in print or digital, um, it's just not good enough. You've got to challenge it. And it's brilliant when you're able to set up independent media channels like a Celtic State of Mind, whereby we don't have an agenda. We're trying to build an audience, of course we are, but we're doing it in a, a, a long-term way. I mean, a Celtic State of Mind's been up and running now for three years. We've never done the clickbait thing. Uh, we've secured some sponsorship that's allowed us to buy equipment, etc., and put us out more uh, often and more regularly. We're going to continue to do that. And um, we want you to get involved. And the Bulletin's a great way of getting as many Celtic fans involved as possible. Now, David... David Crines, you're commenting on Facebook. Welcome. You can comment on Facebook, Twitter, and also on YouTube. If you're commenting on Twitter, you've got to do it through Periscope because the Twitter comments don't appear on the live broad broadcast. And I only become aware of them after the event when I'm going through my Twitter feed. So apologies, I'm not ignoring anybody. It's just that they may not appear on the screen. David, I think our squad is now good enough to have a serious run in the Europa League this year. As long as we gel, can you imagine the confidence after qualifying from our group and hitting fifth gear? I think it's frightening what the Celtic squad is capable of. Um, I said last season, uh, after, the, you know, largely due to the Lazio games, but, you know, some people have been coming up with some stats about a record away from home in Europe. Um, Neil Lennon has been part of that. And I said, I think that Lennon is capable as a manager. I think he's capable of doing something beyond the domestic success. And I said that, and I, I might have sounded daft after the Ferenc Varos game when we bounced at the Champions League, but I still believe that we have made progress on a European level within the Europa League, of course. We'd much rather doing it. Uh, we were doing it in the Champions League. So I take your point, David, and we are. We're buoyant, uh, we're positive. It's been an excellent transfer window. Once Neil Lennon, I don't think there's a best Celtic 11. I don't think I can say to you there's a best Celtic 11 because what we have there is a group of players that can, we, we can adapt. Now we can adapt them depending on who we're playing and we can adapt them depending on how that particular game is going. Now the bench that we've got uh, with more subs being introduced to the game, we're, we're utilising it. Just look at the St. Johnson game and we're going to continue to utilise it as we go through uh, we go through the uh, the season in five different tournaments. Now, um, we're an hour into the bulletin and I appreciate that I haven't got through everybody's points. We'll take a few more points and we will be back. Uh, we will be back. Now, Darren G, let's have a wee look. We'll be back tomorrow at 12.30, I promise. Uh, keep it zooming. Call in free. The show is brilliant, as it is in my opinion. I think so. I think it is. Uh, what we might get, Darren, is we might get the opportunity, let's say, for an ex-player to come and join us on the bulletin. And they might not be able to come into, into the studio. And I think it would be worthwhile in that scenario where that Axom logo that you see at the moment over there um, might be an ex-player. And if he can't come into the studio, I think it's worthwhile if they're able to, to call in. Um, you know, on a Zoom basis. Obviously, we don't use Zoom. It's a different programme, but it's the same idea. Uh, but the call-in has been suggested, Dan. It's been suggested time and time again. I just think it would be extremely difficult to manage, to be honest with you. Um, so, yes, I'm delighted with the transfer window. I asked you at the top of the show where you would be in relation to the uh, transfer window. Would you, would you mark it an 8 out of a 10? 9 out of 10? What is a 10 out of 10, you know? I think we covered just about all bases with that. Um, so I'm delighted, that's what I can say. Uh, the other point, and we might ask you this tomorrow, who is Otten Edwards' ideal partner at Celtic? Does he have one? Do we rotate it? I think sometimes we need to rotate it with Eddie as well. Uh, we rested him a couple of times domestically uh, before the European Games. I think that was wise. Um, he was starting to look a bit leggy. Edwards' feet, they're incredible, aren't they? He, he kind of waltzes past players. The ball sticks to his toe. We've not seen much of that. And I think that is just that wee bit of rustiness uh, where he's not been 100%. But we've got four strikers now. We've got four strikers we can call on. And um, we're going into the, 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 you know, I've seen the second part of the season. It's not quite um, after the transfer window. And I think we should be confident. The next big challenge is against uh, Gerard Rangers. 
And yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I said that last season when they beat us in December. There's a real challenge on. That's where we are now. We've got to take that. Do I think Celtic have got a better side? 100%. 100% I think we've got a better side and I think we're going to beat Rangers um, at Celtic Park uh, but there's loads of talking to be done before that game so see tomorrow we'll be back at our usual slot at 12.30 everything's in place I will have my regular Wednesday guest alongside me that's Colin Watt so please join us at 12.30 I've got to thank everybody again for joining us on the bulletin it's a real pleasure um, and hopefully when things settle down we can get some of you uh, you regulars in here uh, to, to see the studio but get involved in the bulletins as well because that, that day will come our time will come uh, believe me so there we are that's the end of today's broadcast all that's left for me to say is thank you to every one of you for getting involved in a Celtic state of mind and I'll see you again tomorrow at 12.30